Hello everyone, I'm Karen Cho, anchor for CNBC. Thank you so much for joining us today for this important session. We welcome all WEF stakeholders as well as we turn the spotlight on cyber security. Now, cyber attacks, as you know, are not new, but the threat level has increased as we think about a changing digital and geopolitical landscape. A huge shift to remote working during the pandemic, more data moved to the cloud, a rise in e-commerce and financial transactions online, more and more connected devices, and an increased geopolitical threat with the war in Ukraine. Over the next 45 minutes of this session, we'll discuss how leaders can prepare for future cyber attacks. Just a quick housekeeping matter, if you do want to connect with this debate, hashtag WEF22 is uh, the one that you can use. We'll also open up the discussion in about 20 minutes' time, so be ready with some questions. Let me introduce you to our panellists today. Jürgen Stock, Secretary General for Interpol France. Josephine Teo, Minister for Communications and Information of Singapore. Chanda Prakesh Gunani, who is Managing Director, CEO of Tech Mahindra, and Robert Lee, CEO and founder of Dragos from the States. Well, first up, Jürgen, let me turn it to you. The World Economic Forum Global Security Outlook Report indicates that cyber attacks over the past year were up to 125%. How do you set, assess the cyber security risk as we now also weigh up the threat of state-sponsored attacks? Yeah, thank you very much. I think there's no reason to sound the all clear. Um, the statistics are suffering from the fact that, of course, still many of the companies, many of the victims are not reporting the incidents uh, to the police or to national agencies. So we are still struggling that all the information maybe comes from the roughly between 5 and 10 percent of the cases that are reported um, to law enforcement. I think there's no doubt that the threat is increasing. We see criminal groups continuing, um, acting in a more sophisticated way. The way in which they organize themselves is very different from the traditional mafia style, you know, where people know each other, maybe same family, same region. Here it's like the yellow pages in the internet where you offer your specialization, they connect for a specific attack, and then they, they change, uh, which also makes it for law enforcement even more important on the one hand. So this is becoming more sophisticated, more difficult also because it's global by nature. And of course, law enforcement, we still operate mainly in our national jurisdictions. On the other hand, I think the major risk is still not that much IT security in a way of technical issues. It's human failure that opens the door for criminals to attack the systems, to take uh, data hostage, uh, one uh, victimization, a second victimization with the data. And as the world is becoming more connected, we have been discussing that here at the WEF a number of times, the challenge is still how do we connect the various dots that need to be connected that allow us to share information in real time, to allow us to be prepared for the next attack which will come. It's only a matter of time. So that, that is primarily the challenge. If I can just follow up quickly, what is the link between state-sponsored cyber attacks and the criminal underworld? I mean, first of all, I have to say that Interpol is focusing on criminal activity. So those perhaps 80% where criminals are behind that are still interested in money, in, in data. The, the risk here is what we also see in traditional crime areas, that weapons that are used today by the military, for instance, maybe a couple of years later will show up in the darknet and will be used by, by criminals for even more sophisticated attacks. That is a major concern in the physical world, weapons that are used on the battlefield and tomorrow will be used by organized crime groups, but the same applies for the, for the digital uh, weapons that maybe today are used by the military, developed by military, and tomorrow will be available uh, uh, for criminals. That's quite a warning, isn't it? Minister, let me turn to you. Late last year, Singapore updated its cybersecurity strategy, in particular to take a more proactive stance to protect critical infrastructure. There's plenty of reasons why Singapore would be a target. With sanctions against Russia that you joined, the city-state is a growing hub for international finance and business, attracting more and more business away from Hong Kong, for instance. Just give us a sense how you perceive the threat over the next 12 months to Singapore. Right. Well, first of all, let me say that it's an honour to be on this panel. We have a veteran in law enforcement and we've got uh, very prominent business leaders that provide a range of uh, 
you know, cybersecurity and IT services to so many different businesses. Um, let me just share in a, a perspective, you know, uh, as a minister who really would like to see in the short term um, a more solid uh, recovery for our economies, and in the long term would really like to prepare our people uh, to succeed in the digital age. Um, it's probably right for us to not try and think of cyber risk in very discrete terms because they are interconnected with a whole uh, range of risks, geopolitical risks, technology bifurcation, the Russian-Ukraine uh, conflict, which has, as a result, created economic turmoil, questions about energy security, um, and even you know, just plain old supply chain disruptions. All of these, I think, have got the potential to spill over into cyberspace. Now, one key trend that we uh, have been watching out for is exactly as Jürgen talked about, which is that cyber criminals, in terms of their level of sophistication, they seem to be catching up with state-sponsored APT actors. And we are observing that actually even um, this has become a natural national security question because critical informa information infrastructure uh, can come under threat. And I think one problem uh, that we face is that uh, this is growing at a very fast speed. This underground ecosystem that Jürgen you know, outlined is extremely lucrative and it is self-funding. So any time that you have capabilities that are existing in a system that is self-funding and makes a lot of money, you can expect it to grow. And I think this is an area that really demands uh, urgent attention a lot of international cooperation to rein in. A second area of risk I would talk about is that um, you know, there has been just rampant uh, exploitation of supply chain as well as um, you know, all kinds of software vulnerabilities, a third party um, that are coming through you know, to uh, a lot of businesses. No business um, you know, can, can operate without using some uh, third party software. And there used to be a relationship of trust that existed between the clients and uh, the managed services provider. And this trust is being undermined. And when you have an absence of trust, you know, how can you continue to digitalize your businesses at the rate that uh, would bring about uh, great benefits? So this, I think, is a, a long-standing problem that uh, isn't going away quite so soon. And um, let me just uh, close off by saying that there are two associated risks that uh, we would um, you know, characterize not necessarily as cyber risks. One has to do with the fact that the threat surfaces are expanding so quickly, and there is a real danger that we don't have enough talent, don't have enough capabilities to deal with them. A second is really uh, the problem of uh, what I call distractedness. There are so many problems that business leaders are dealing with. And um, if you know, it comes at the cost of de prioritizing cybersecurity, then I think this is going to have um, you know, a lot of uh, long-term consequences that uh, we will have to pay for, and they will hurt us. So I will just pause right there. Minister, thank you. And I'm glad you brought up the supply chain, because one of the reports in recent days was about connected farm devices being hacked. And if we think about the food shortage we have at this stage, how it's proving inflationary across populations, you can see why cyber attacks in this particular area could be a major issue. On that note, Chandra, if I can ask you about the business community and the reaction here, because we know that there's been a huge digital acceleration during the pandemic. There's reputational risk from cybersecurity, financial risk as well, we've also witnessed on the back of several attacks. How do you perceive the threat for the next year or so? I think, uh, Karen, when you step back, first is, you know, the dependence of technology on some industries is a lot more evident. Uh, you know, you saw the power sector, the utility sector, the telecom, healthcare. Now, with the during the pandemic, even online education. Uh, and in a lot of ways, I mean, uh, I'm sure the Honorable Minister would agree, the e-government services. Mm -hmm. The dependence on technology is so high that we need to be cautious that if that is the dependence, then you treat it as an infrastructure. 
And if it is an infrastructure, you need to t budget time, money, and energy for maintaining that infrastructure. I think uh, when I look out, I think many corporates have taken a responsibility to look out for the country attacks. They look, they look out for the dark web attacks. They look at individual attacks. But the question is, how often do you maintain? Uh, my personal uh, read is that the boardrooms become very, very active whenever there is a similar industry attack. So if a colonial pipeline is attacked, suddenly the, all the oil companies around the world will become active because they all want to know what happened in that case study and are we safe. Uh, similarly, uh, the scope of audit. The scope of audit, uh, many companies only assume saving their servers or networks or the end user devices in their premises are good enough. But the reality is the ecosystem is much bigger. So one of the banks that we work with, uh, we were engaged to audit, but the audit was very specific, like banks like to be very specific. It was the server network and their premises. And uh, we said, no, that's not enough. And we had to prove it to them through the law firm that they engaged that on a Friday evening, one human, this is the, the point uh, Jorgen was making, that it is mainly the human failure. One human, you know, picking up a phishing email brought the whole the system down. So I think we need to be cautious that our vulnerabilities are now outside the system also. And when we do ethical hacking, A, we should do it more frequently. And number two is we need to take into account the ecosystem. That's a good point that you make. There are red flags when it's an external contact, but when it's somebody you work with day in, day out, who sends that email, it does uh, provide a different level of risk, doesn't it? Uh, Robert, I want to turn to you. I think most of us feel there's always someone who has greater IT experience than us in the room. You're the exception. You're probably the, the resident tech expert. Very interesting background as well. You were one of the first or the first to investigate the 2015-2016 attacks on critical infrastructure in Ukraine. Now as we have a physical war playing out on the ground with devastating consequences, just draw the links for us to what could start as uh, something that looks like it's just an attack on the global community, but it's very much focused on a specific area. How do you look at that now in hindsight and look forward to the risk? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think most business leaders, most executives, most board members, they have these cybersecurity conversations. Uh, the awareness, as we were talking about before, is very, very high. But we still very much have a focus on IT. Even when, like, uh, my skill set is an example. I really don't know anything about your IT. I know a lot about your operations technology, the control systems, how a power system works, how a manufacturing system works. Um, but most companies, when they talk about cybersecurity, spend more time on the website than they do on the gas turbine system. But mm -hmm. the stuff that actually generates you revenue, the things that actually have national security impact, the things that have safety impact, the things that have environmental impact, it's the operations side. It's all the control systems. Those were never really connected before. They started getting connected in mass probably about 15 years ago. People still think that they're disconnected now. They're not. You save yourself the audit. They're connected. Um, but because they're getting connected at the same time the digital economy is going the direction that it's going, and at the same time that our systems are ongoing a massive, massive change, especially as we move towards a, a more sustainable and equitable like energy system as an example, we are operating on, on a little bit of a knife's edge. And so we've got adversaries that know how to target operations systems. They've included engineers with their cybersecurity people. We've got systems that are more connected than ever. And something like a disruption on an electric system years ago, it probably have been okay. More fear than actual impact in some cases. You can design the big ones, but we make safe and reliable infrastructure in the industrial community all the time. But take, for an example, the, the sort of green energy change. An electric system, as an example now, is operating in such a way that power is on demand in real time for the lowest kilowatt hour. So previously, if you caused one company to go down, I could have enough backup energy on the system, and we had the concept of inertia. You have big spinning equipment. Big spinning equipment and inertia sort of slows down the effects of things, and you can respond. 
But now that we're going towards wind energy, solar, et cetera, it's all inverter-based resource. It's direct current. I don't have big spinning equipment much anymore. Now I don't have that inertia on the system. Now if I have an impact on an electric system, I don't have the backup power, and I don't have the time to respond, and it's more connected, and there's more adversaries that understand it. That's not a good place to be. So when we look at cybersecurity of critical infrastructure, it's important for everybody to take away the fact that the critical part of critical infrastructure are those operations technology systems. Of course, we want you to do the IT stuff as well. Um, but if we're going to talk national security especially, really got to put a focus there. And uh, I would say probably the, sort of the closing comment on that one is governments do have to be very aware of the difference between business risk and national security risk. If it's business risk, companies should be paying for themselves and doing that work. But if it's a national security risk, there's got to be support and potentially even resourcing from the federal government so that that entity actually takes it and does something with it. If I can just follow up on that point, whether there is a, a pre-Ukraine versus post-Ukraine moment for the industry here and whether companies, countries that have joined sanctions or taken a, a move to exit Russia and doing operations there, are they at a greater level of risk now versus before? For sure. We, we've absolutely seen countries that have come out with sanctions, uh, countries that have been public in discussion, uh, uh, countries that are connected to that system, uh, we see them getting targeted much more. And so there's absolutely a geopolitical overlay of any time you're talking about critical infrastructure cyber attacks. Um, the other thing that we just need to be really, really mindful of, and I think this is a suggestion as well to the audience as you think about those challenges, is if, if you're an executive in your next board meeting and your next executive discussion, there's really two questions that I would focus you on. Number one, when you get all your metrics and your stats and your cyber heat maps that you barely understand and we all love the colors, ask the question, is that the enterprise IT or is that the enterprise? Because mm. very often you are doing far less on the side of the business that you care most about. The second thing I would suggest is the scenarios, and this goes back to your Ukraine discussion. Very often, especially in the technical community, it's all about technical controls. Are we doing enough patching? What about vulnerability management? What about antivirus? What about firewalls? What about this, that, the others? Our problem is not needing next-gen AI, blockchain, or whatever else. Our problem usually is just about rolling out the things that we've already invested in doing something. But don't focus on the technical controls. We don't treat our business in any way like that anywhere else. Instead, focus on scenarios. Should a power company anywhere in the world be able to prevent, detect, and respond to Ukraine 2015 and 2016 scenario? Right. Yeah, of course. We've seen it. You should. Should they theorize about what happens when China, Iran, Russia, US, or whatever superpowers team up against you? No, it hasn't happened. Don't, don't focus on the theoretical. Right. But if something's actually happened in your industry, you owe it to the community to actually have that scenario covered, not a single technical control. Mm -hmm. Minister, can I get a quick response from you? Bob has just mentioned that if it's a national security threat that a company is facing, there is a role for funding for the state. How do you feel about that? Would Singapore step in and provide funding for companies that are under increased threat because of national security? Well, I think in the first place, um, as a you know, state um, we have to look at our own um, you know, provision of services and ensure that we set standards at a high enough level. Um, actually, if you look at uh, some of the critical information infrastructure, uh, quite a, a lot of it is operated by the state. So say, for example, you know, even if our power grid is, um, is privatized to a very large extent, um, the cybersecurity measures that we impose on the power generation companies um, is, uh, is one way of ensuring that the standards are met. But there are also other ways in which we can help. For example, understanding where the risks are. I think this is where government can play an active part. But I also want to add to what um, you know, Robert was saying, which is that um, I think it makes sense for us you know, uh, when we think about scenarios, not to think that uh, we have not yet been breached. And in fact, in Singapore, um, the way we think about it is that the cyber attack uh, is not a question of uh, if, but when. And so uh, we have to move from preventive measures to being able to recover from an attack. And so cyber resilience, building it into enterprise risk management, um, is, is really important. And uh, it has to be at a very high level of uh, uh, leadership that uh, demands that these steps be taken. Minister, you've taken us neatly into the next area. I want to talk about perception gaps because the World Economic Forum has identified that there is a perception gap when it comes to just how prepared businesses are around cybersecurity versus cyber leaders. Now, 92% of business executives agree that cyber resilience is integrated into enterprise risk management strategies. Only 55% of cyber executives agree. So the experts in the house think that the uh, level of planning is just not adequate at this stage. Can I come to you on that point? Because, Jürgen, you've seen the level of uh, preparedness when it comes to locking down facilities, stopping criminals from entering the premises. What do you make of that perception gap and whether 
business leaders are ready for the task of averting cybersecurity attacks? I mean, from my experience and talking to a, a number of senior leaders in companies, uh, there is definitely the level of, of awareness has been rising. It's, it's much better. But that does not necessarily mean that there is a comprehensive understanding of the cybersecurity risk in a company, mm. including what you said, the, the supply chain, your partners you are, you are connected with. And again, this comprehensive understanding and translating that into implementing the necessary measures, doing it often enough because what we need actually is information exchange in real time. Um, because the situation is so dynamic, crime patterns are changing, sometimes within hours slightly or within a, a, a couple of weeks at least. And, and being a part of, a, of an ecosystem nationally, regionally and internationally that allows these real-time information exchange. So for me, it's not a surprise that there is still a gap between the senior management, that they are, there is a general awareness. But again, investing in specific measures, including your, your, your teams, your staff, to reduce human failure in, in these procedures and to understand that this is something you cannot just do once a year, like a, like a medical check. Um, you have to do it as something permanent. There is still obviously a lot for us to do and to increase the dialogue, for instance, between law enforcement, because we, on the one hand, we are aware what's going on. On the other hand, we need the data, which are in the private sector. So we need your reports. Without your reports, we are blind. And, and, and that is something I mentioned, this, this huge number of unreported crime. That is a gap that we need to close together, not just law enforcement. That requires that we build bridges between our silos, the islands of information, and in a more strongly way institutionalize the cooperation that already exists. And for us, the World Economic Forum is an important player on the global, uh, on the global level. Europe is going down the pathway of requiring some sort of reporting within 24 hours, which is to your point that often we see this just brushed under the carpet, that people don't want to disclose that there has been some sort of cyber breach because of reputational risk. For whatever reason, yeah. Right. Uh, Chad, let me come to you because you did touch on that perception gap a moment ago. And one of the conversations I had with the cybersecurity expert this week was that nothing's changed in 20 years, that people still perceive there is a risk. They're trying to protect absolutely everything in the organisation rather than the most critical information. Just touch on what the strategy should be for business from here, given that there is such a wide gap in how the industry experts feel the preparation should be. So, I mean, I'm surprised that you think nothing has changed in 20 years. That's not me, that's an <laughs> industry right? expert. So, I can only say that, you know, when I was walking up here, I accidentally met the chairman of IBM, and uh, uh, he said, where are you going? This is Arvind Krishna, who's the chairman of IBM. And I said, I'm going for the cyber security, uh, you know, at the forum. And he said, oh, that's a threat of the decade. And it will remain the threat for the next decade. So, so one part is very, very clear that most of us do realize that it is a threat. The second part is that most of us also realize that while we know 100 ways to secure our IT systems or the network or the end user or the supply chain, but the attacker has to succeed only once. Mm -hmm. So clearly for us, whether it is technology, it needs to be refreshed, whether it is the processes, they need to be, you know, you know, talking about those viruses. I mean, or the healthcare as you put it, Jurgen. I mean, it is very, very clear that our processes have to be current. And number third is people also, it is not only that uh, they need to know how to protect, but they also need to know how to anticipate. So I think uh, the world over, we need to realize that the various studies have shown there is a skill shortage in cybersecurity. And I don't think that all of us are putting enough attention to creating that lateral skill force of 2.7 million people that are required by 2025. So I think it's a bigger challenge of people, process, and technology. So Catherine, maybe just you know, building on what Chandra has said, I suspect that the perception gap it comes about because one group 
is looking at all the known unknowns and saying that we've got this. And then there is another group that is thinking about all the unknown unknowns and saying, no, we haven't really got it. Mm -hmm. And that's why you, know, you have uh, this very big difference in perception. In cybersecurity, exactly as Chandra says, you don't know what you don't know. And you have to believe that you know, uh, these are very serious vulnerabilities. And you have to be on the lookout and trying to exchange information with each other, try and get better to understanding the problem. I'm glad I you think touched many, on it, yes. many companies still start seriously working on that when they first have been hit and, and the data are blocked. This is where the action starts. Oh, who are my, my points of contact? Where are my data? Who can help? That's my experience in talking to a lot of senior leaders who called, I've been attacked, what am I going to do? Too late, sorry. You can see how engaged the panel is, but I know there are some questions out here on the floor, so we have promised to open it up for the conversation with our uh, audience. So if you would like to pitch a question, please stand up and we will bring a microphone to you. Uh, we have a, a question here first. If we have a microphone ready. If you could state where you're from too, please. Yes, my name is Wolfgang Kleinwächter. I'm a professor emeritus from the University of Aarhus. Uh, the United Nations have started negotiations on a convention on cybercrime. Uh, uh, what do you expect? And the question goes in particular to Mr. Stock and Madame Theo. Should I start? So, yes. Um, thank you, Wolfgang, for that good question. I mean, it's a, it's a global problem, right? And it requires a global solution as many other threats that the, the world is facing. You cannot deal with that in, just on a national level or on a regional level or in isolation that doesn't work. It requires global coordination. The, 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 the challenge for Interpol to connect 195 member countries. What we expect is that, that law enforcement is mentioned because hopefully we all agree that investigation, prosecuting, prosecution and getting the actors behind bars is an important part of protecting uh, our systems. So we, we are a part of these uh, negotiations. We hope that we can, um, we can make sure that the interests of global law enforcement are represented in, in this UN approach, which we consider to be important. Can I just add to what Jürgen has said? Uh, I fully agree with him. Uh, there is a great need for international cooperation. And that's why I think Singapore makes an effort to participate in all of these. Uh, even though, you know, in comparison to uh, the threats faced by many other countries, I, I think ours is of just a different scale. Uh, but I would say that uh, apart from having a convention, uh, there is another area that I think is also very important, and that has to do with capacity building. Mm -hmm. You can have a convention, but ultimately it is the individuals that are operating each of the country's cybersecurity systems that have to uh, intervene at the appropriate times. And what we have done is to work with our international counterparts um, to try and create um, programs as well as training opportunities. In our part of the world, in ASEAN, for example, uh, we've worked together uh, to set up a cybersecurity center of excellence. Uh, it's very well received, um, whether it is the US, whether it's Interpol, whether it's the UK. Uh, so many countries have decided to come on board to try and share knowledge. Because in cybersecurity, we fully recognize that it is a team sport. And the better we are able you know, to make every player a competent player, uh, the stronger the team is going to be. So that's, that's how we are approaching it. And of course, you need a full team as well to, to play the game properly. Robert, before we move on, can I just ask you, because you're charged with the cleanup when these security attacks happen, do you think it would make a difference if there were, were global coordination or some form of a UN resolution? I think it's a really nice idea, and I wish you all the best of it. Uh, <laughs> thank you. But no, I don't think it will actually help anything. Uh, you have always had agreements between states on things, even to the point of like critical infrastructure attacks. Most of us agree that you shouldn't target civilians. And in the moment that a government wants to, they do. Uh, when it's in their necessity, they do. Uh, and so I, I just think global discussions and so forth, really, really important. The awareness, really, really important. Thinking that a treatise or similar is going to fix it, I think, is, is not necessary. Um, but I do want to look at the things that work. If you look at the cybersecurity agency in Singapore, if you look at the um, cybersecurity Infra uh, infrastructure security agency in the US, if you look at the Australian government, their ACSE program, these different government agencies have come out and raised the discussion completely on their own. Like it's not vendors or everybody else, it's government agencies having international cooperation and making sure that board members down to practitioners know what to do. 
that type of stuff works. Go repeat what works and scale what works. And if you want to do some other ideas too, that's fine, but do them in parallel. Don't do one or the other. Let's get some more questions in. There was one down the front here. Thank you. Good Thank you. Um, hello, uh, my name is Natalia, and I'm here as a global shaper, as a curator of the Live Hub. When the war started, the headquarter they um, took out all information from the website, information about all Ukrainian hubs, meaning about all Ukrainian shapers. In the meantime, we do have our Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn profiles. The question is, what would you do on our place? Should we hide all information about ourselves? Thank you. Chandra, do you want to take that one? You know, honestly, the sources of information uh, are so many that I don't know whether you can be a universal policing. So, for example, when we were talking about this, uh, you know, central competency regarding the repository of, let us say, malware, I mean, the reality is people in the CSO community and the people in the hacking community, they have all the repositories available, and that's why the tool companies have created some of the controls. So I personally believe that we have to assume that the information would be available. We do should, while we can try policing, but that information will be available whether it is through Facebook or whether it is through any other social media. And uh, I think our strategy has to be with an assumption that uh, people know what the tools are available, people know what malware is available, people know what kind of security measures are there, and within that, how to evolve and encrypt or protect yourselves. Yeah. If, if I could take a spin at that, I would say, especially when you're talking about conflict and shooting wars and not just espionage, uh, I think the topic of personal safety is something you should think a lot about. And I think those type of actions are really important. I, I agree that that information is available somewhere. But a lot of these state actors, we view them as if they're one big state actor, the US, Russia, Iran, big country level. But the reality is there's a bunch of different agencies, a bunch of different teams, and the person coming after you is not Russia, China, Iran, US. It's five to 10 people on a subset of a subset of a subset of teams. So maybe somewhere in the government they have the information, but that team might not. And so when you're talking about personal safety, I do think limiting your exposure, especially in those type of environments, is a very wise thing to do. There's also an information war that comes up. I mean, we saw one specific example where I think it was a makeup artist in Ukraine who was a part of one of the, the areas of conflict and her profile was used against her in the information war by the Russians. So it's obviously another area to, to think about. But let's get some more questions and I know that there's a little bit of interest here. Um, down the back. So thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah, so just uh, on the cyber war, we don't have rules of engagement uh, for like multilateral system to just, uh, I, I understand uh, your point, Robert, in terms of like we need uh, solutions, but I also believe that we need multilateral solutions for that. So do you have ideas for engagement in cyber war, like rules of engagement, uh, Geneva Convention for cyber war uh, actions? Uh, any? I sit on a, a panel of the UN Secretary General on effective multilateralism and we're thinking, of, we're thinking about this right now, so that's why I'm just also consulting you. Thank you. I think a number of countries are trying very hard to develop rules of the road that could you know, be subscribed to by everyone. Um, the United Nations has a open-ended working group, for example, where many countries have been engaged in multi-year uh, conversations. But as Robert has also intimated, it's uh, not an easy conversation. Uh, obviously, there are very diverse interests. Um, and, um, but I think we are making progress. Uh, as it turns out, Singapore is the chair of uh, this current uh, edition of the Open-Ended Working Group. And uh, at the very least, I think, um, you know, when the, the Swiss chaired it the last time round, you know, there was at least a document uh, that they could agree, you know, what were some of the baseline provisions that everyone, you know, should be able to provide. Um, can, the in, uh, can this conversation be taken deeper? And can we develop, you know, more, um, you know, robust, um, sort of understanding of how we would operate with each other? The answer is yes. Will we get there anytime soon? I would say we will have to work very hard at it. Jürgen, can I get you on this? I mean, you're used to working across borders. 
we also have a situation there where we know that global cooperation has broken down. China is a great example where there's been trade wars, there's been concerns about the level of information shared between the Chinese and the West. I mean, how do you get around some of these issues as we talk about global cooperation? Yeah, I mean, we try to be the platform where all these countries, to some extent, are coming together, despite all the differences in, in legal systems and in, in political systems. Because one thing is quite clear, any gap we are leaving will be exploited by criminals. And we have seen that also during the, the pandemic, during COVID, how quickly criminals shifted their narrative to the new vulnerabilities of our society. So, so any crisis that occurs will be exploited by, by criminals. We spoke about Metaverse uh, earlier today here. I'm sure as we speak here, criminals are already preparing to use that as a platform for criminal activity. And again, there is no other choice, and this is why Interpol exists, to provide that platform. Is it perfect? No, of course it's not. But on the other hand, are we successful here and there by, by bringing the, the players together, even those who have diplomatic problems to, I mean, difficult to say in these times, yes, we are. There is, I think there is no uh, alternative to that. The internet is global and you need a kind of global kind of police force, or at least we, we try to bring the, the national forces, at least in some cases, together. That, that, that's our mandate. Let's take some more questions. Uh, I believe we have one down the front here. We will take one from the other side of him if we can in a moment too. Okay. Hi, I'm Inon Kostika. I'm a co-founder for a cloud security company named uh, Wiz. And we're working with multiple Fortune 500 companies. And what we've realized that the key to actually initiate something, uh, uh, an improvement, is working with the engineers that build the cloud applications. You mentioned that humans are the biggest failure. You mentioned that we need to train more. And just now we're seeing questions from uh, people, personal people saying, okay, I exposed the information. I didn't know what would be the outcomes in the long run. So my to, question to you is basically, how can we enable a more global education on, or awareness on cyber, one that can provide everyone with tools to assess their risk? My, my parents, for instance, they got an email saying we have a, pictures of you pay one thousand dollars to this address and i'm like that's nonsense that's just extortion ignore it but they didn't know they were scared for two days they had nowhere to go to to ask that question so my question to you, how can we create a global community to train and raise awareness china do you want to talk about that so you know i would agree that nipping the problem in the bud is the right way because if you write a code which is secure and which has got enough firewalls in it, I think you are making it difficult for anybody to break into the code. So I think that's a fundamentally just the right way. Number two, I think we covered this point about education. Uh, there is no immediate resolution to that part. That whether that education can be you know, given to tens of millions of users now, because as we all know, the vulnerability is not only by one operating system or one piece of code or one tool. The vulnerabilities can come in from a smart city, a smart factory, or from a smart metering. I mean, whichever way you want to look at it, and uh, to prevent it, I mean, if you were to say there are two ways to prevent it, one is become good citizens so there is no crime, or you put, put in enough police people so that there is no crime because people are what, you know, afraid of the police. I think both of them is required. You need to educate, but it will take time. And till that time, I think some of us have to act as a catalyst. And I definitely would agree that people like you, when you write your code, try and make it secure. Right. And the more we start, as a community, start paying you premium because you exactly. deliver a secure code, mm -hmm. I think that is the right way because people will learn that there is an economic benefit to secure code. Right. So again, can I just add to that to two perspectives? One, I completely agree. Security by design should become a competitive advantage for you. 
if you are able to offer a product to the market that has got more security features built in, and then it should command a premium. And people over time will learn that it is in their interest uh, to pay for it. Uh, but I would also say that I don't know that you need um, a, a global effort to get this going. I think as national governments, we all owe our citizens a duty of care. And um, it is in our interest to help educate our, our citizens to understand the risk um, that uh, they are exposed to when they engage uh, in, in, in the cyber domain. Um, it starts from you know, children in school, um, helping them to understand you know, that they can be exposed to online harms and how to deal with it. Um, it can be, for example, in collaboration with corporates. Uh, in Singapore, for example, um, Google has a very good program. Um, they help teach our school-going kids how to um, do simple things, like uh, have uh, strong passwords. Right. Uh, but there are also different segments of the population that are vulnerable. Seniors, you know, who are uh, targets uh, for uh, scammers. And um, apart from strengthening our defences against scammers, there is also a lot of education that can be done by the government. Uh, this is sometimes police, um, you know, collaborating with uh, people sector organisations, civic, uh, civil society. I think these are all efforts that can be taken at the national level, and it should be in our own interest to do so. Right. And, and once again, I mean, we need law enforcement needs the industry to help us getting the tools to investigate cybercrime in that new virtual en environment. We have a Champions League of law enforcement agencies who are well-trained and, and well-equipped, but let's say 195 member countries' police services, let's say maybe 70% are not well-equipped and not trained, and, and very often they have nothing. So we also need the, the support from the private sector to develop easy-to-handle uh, easy solutions to investigate that type of crime. Robert? Well, yeah, I would, I would agree with everything that was said. I would just add again, sort of the scenarios and requirements discussion. I think the minister was talking earlier about distraction. Uh, should your parents be worrying about a cyber attack that take down transformers and electric system? Probably not until they're operating them, right? So we come out all the time with do all these cybersecurity things. And I think as, as leaders, we sometimes fail our communities in setting the requirements to start with, even at a business level. What do you need to worry about at this company? Set the two or three scenarios, the requirements that you have, et cetera, that you need to care about. That company doesn't need to be prepared for every possible cybersecurity thing. And we talk about education. Where do you start these days with cybersecurity? It's so broad, you cannot be a generalist in cybersecurity anymore. 20 years ago, absolutely. Today, no. Cloud specialists, industrial specialists, whatever. And we just say industrial, and that's different from being a specialist in electric power versus pharmaceuticals. So I, I think the setting the requirements, setting those scenarios, and figuring out what do we actually want out of our communities other than cyber safe, cyber hygiene, or whatever else you want to throw out that ultimately just gets this large peanut butter spread instead of actually doing things right. that matter. We are out of time for questions. I'm so sorry. I know that there's plenty of interest still, but just 10 seconds each. What do you want to see happen in the next 12 months, Robert? I would like to see at an executive level a better understanding of the operation technology risks that exist in companies and put some effort towards it. Pick a path, doesn't matter, but pick a path that realize that you cannot copy and paste your IT strategy into your power plant. Chanda? Uh, from my perspective, including the policymakers here, uh, 10 seconds. Focus on education, focus on people, focus on skills. Minister? Uh, cybersecurity is a wicked problem. You never get to solve it once and for all. It should never be an afterthought. It should always be a priority. Yeah, okay. Stronger, more institutionalised public-private partnership. Oh, that was very snappy. Thank you so much, Jürgen, <laughs> Minister Chanda and Robert. We appreciate your time.